Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Luke chapter number 1, uh, verse number 26 is where we'll begin in just a few moments. If you have children in your home or you have had children in your home uh, any time in the last uh, several years, uh, then you have no doubt bought your child a toy for Christmas. Uh, you were excited about buying your child this toy for Christmas, and then you had to get the toy out of the box for the child. Have you noticed lately that they are, I, I don't know if the twist tie uh, unions have gotten involved somehow with this, but any toy that has about 18 twist ties on the back to try to get it out of the packaging. I'm not quite sure uh, why that is. You know, the kid wants to get this thing so bad and it takes you about 15 minutes to get it out of the package. And then you're ready to turn it on. They're ready to go. And then there was one part of the package that you didn't read before you wrapped it and before you prepared to give that gift to the child. And it was three little words, batteries not included. And I could tell just by looking at your faces, I'm giving that scenario that every single one of us have been part of something like that before. Batteries not included. Uh, oh, it's frustrating, isn't it? One, because your child is so disappointed. And of course, you go to that drawer, you know, in your house where you keep everything. And of course, there's got to be uh, some D batteries in there. And you realize, well, there aren't. And of course, you could run to the store, but well, it's Christmas Day, and so uh, there's that toy that they want to play with so badly, and it's just going to have to sit there for a day. Uh, it, it, it's there, it's ready, but there's no power. That's frustrating, isn't it? Uh, listen, we can make fun of kids, but if you had a gift today uh, that uh, you wanted to use and batteries weren't included, you'd be a little bit upset too, uh, because there's something about having a gift, having a toy, whatever it may be, and knowing that it has capability, but no power. And it's a very frustrating thing. The title of my message this morning, as, as brief as it may be, and I don't like promising brief messages because as soon as I do, your mind starts uh, ticking down on the clock, uh, but I would say the title of my message this morning is this, simply, Battery is Not Included. And the reason why is because I feel like many times that's how people feel about the Lord. He's capable, but there's no power. Oh, oh he's capable. But there's no power, just like that toy that that you that the child would look at or that you would look at and say, boy, I like it. I adore it. Maybe someday it'll be useful. But at the moment, there's no power. And it's amazing to me how many of us, even as believers, can look at our Lord and our Savior and have the same thought process in our own mind. You can remain seated this morning for the reading of the Word of God, but I'd encourage you as we look at Luke chapter number one, in fact, it's a passage that we read last night, I'd encourage you that as we look at this very familiar passage, please do not gloss over these words because we've looked at them many times, even already once within the last 24 hours. Just allow the Lord to speak to you afresh and anew as we look at these verses once again. Luke chapter one, beginning in verse number 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, 
She hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, referencing what happened earlier in Luke chapter number one and the birth of John the Baptist, which would take place later in Luke chapter number one. And verse number 37 is where we'll finish today. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Batteries included. Capability and power. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Verse number 37 is an important verse. It, it's so important that it's not just found here in Luke chapter number one. It's also found later on in Luke in chapter number 18, but also in the books of Matthew and Mark as well. Of course, we understand anytime you find a verse in the Bible, it's important. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be in the Bible. I mean, these are the insights that you came here on a Christmas day for, right? If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be in the Bible. But I would say that anytime a thought is amplified more than once, particularly within the Gospels, it really should give us pause to notice and to evaluate specifically, is this something that I really need to evaluate within my own life? And as I said last night, there are some things that we understand theologically, but practically we never make application. If I was to say this morning, do you believe that with God anything is possible? That we would all say, theologically, of course, pastor, I believe that God can do anything. I don't think there's anyone here that's a believer that would say anything different. But practically, we live our lives in a much different way, in a much different fashion. Practically, we live as if God comes with batteries not included. We live as if God has the capability, as if God uh, is capable in the creation, if he is capable uh, in salvation, if he's capable uh, for eternity. But yet, practically speaking, we don't know that it actually makes a difference in our day to day life whether it makes a difference in the problems that we're facing or whether it makes a difference in this wicked world that we live in or if it makes a difference uh, with all of the dissent that we find all around us today. Can God do the impossible? Can God uh, uh, make wells in the desert? Can he make the valley of Baca a, a well, uh, as it says in the Psalms? But we look at just this very text and we ask ourselves, isn't the Christmas story full of impossibilities? I mean, just the very story of Christ's birth itself is full of impossibilities. Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, uh, was barren up to old age and had no child. But yet in her old age, despite her barrenness before her in her child rearing years, and despite the fact now that she was barren simply because she was beyond child rearing years, uh, now is at the point where the angel comes and says, you will have a son, and not only will you have a son, he'll have the spirit of Elijah, which Malachi would say, uh, just a few books before the final book of the Old Testament, would be the forerunner to the Messiah himself. What an impossibility. What about the fact that angels are coming and delivering messages, whether it's to Mary or whether it's to Joseph? Or to the shepherds, as we saw last night, or even after Jesus' birth, that the angel would come back to Joseph and said, go away to a far country uh, until Herod is done with this purge of all of the baby boys that are here in this region. And, and over and over, God does the impossible by sending angelic messages to people. There's a star that guides wise men from the east. I believe these magi, these wise men, uh, would have been descendants of those maybe who had first, fir first heard of Jehovah during the times of Daniel, during the times of the captivity, and they had been calculating maybe even uh, from the book of Daniel, Daniel's 70 weeks, and they were understanding that there was something that was about to happen, and these magi understood more than the Jews did, and they followed the star to the birth of Christ. Improbabilities. Impossibilities. Oh, by the way, did we mention the fact that the Savior of the world was born of a virgin? The capstone of all of the improbabilities and the impossibilities that we could talk about uh, that is here that God is the God that routinely does the impossible. If he could not do the impossible, he would not be God. And so here we are this morning, and you and I understand this about our God, but at the same time, we trust God as one who is batteries not included. He's capable. He's captivating. He's caring. 
yet impotent and without power. Or maybe he's with power for other people's lives. Or maybe he's with power for other ages. I've heard people say, well, God was at work a hundred years ago, or God sure was at work during the apostolic times, as if God's power has now become not because we live in a wicked world today. But may I remind you that God is capable, God is captivating, God is caring, but he's also just as powerful as he ever has been and just as powerful as he was in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 37. The birth of Christ reminds us today, uh, this morning, that with God, nothing shall be impossible. The fact that you and I can be saved is proof that with God, nothing shall be impossible. There is nothing inside of me that is worthy of salvation. There is nothing inside of me that is worthy of heaven. If I was to go to heaven on my own merits, it would be like someone with muddy shoes going into a clean house, making a mess of things. If I was to go to heaven in my own merits, I would make a mess of the perfect place that it was. Uh, That's why you and I cannot go to heaven within our own merits. But yet Jesus Christ was born to what? Born to die upon Calvary, as we just sang a few moments ago. Uh, He wasn't just born to live. He wasn't just born to teach. He wasn't just born to be a good person. He wasn't just born to be a sage. He was born to live, to live a perfect and sinless life and to die on the cross to pay the penalty that you and I couldn't pay. I would say the gospel message is nothing short of impossible apart from God. Apart from God, we can't be saved. Uh, By the way, Muhammad can't do it. Uh, By the way, Buddha can't do it. By the way, the New Age movement can't do it. Uh, By the way, there's no entity of this world that could save your soul. Charles Darwin can't do it. Uh, The modern science of today can't do it. Uh, It's Jesus Christ and Christ alone, and with him, nothing shall be impossible. And there would be many here that would raise their hand and would say, Yes, Pastor, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And by the way, may I take a brief time out and say uh, that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, you need to get that taken care of today. Say, well, pastor, don't you realize there's a bunch of Christians sitting here on Christmas Day? Here's what I realize. There's a bunch of people here uh, that may or may not be saved. Say, pastor, do you doubt my testimony? Uh, Here's what I know. There are people sitting here that may or may not be saved. I don't doubt anyone other than the fact that I understand human nature. And there may even be some who have deluded themselves in believing uh, that they have trusted Jesus Christ, their Savior. And I want to implore you today, do not leave this building. This church was established. This church has grown upon the fact, on the foundation that we want people to call upon Jesus Christ as their Savior. You could give me no greater Christmas gift today than to know that, for me to know that you, who was on the road to hell, uh, have a new life, a, a new birth, a new beginning because of the impossibility of the gospel through Jesus Christ. That's what the first thing is today. But here's what I often find interesting. There are many here who I believe are saved, who have the testimony knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. But if we can trust him with an eternity we can't see, and with a sin debt we can't count on a ledger, then why can't we trust him with all things? If we can trust him with an eternity we can't see, say, well, I've seen heaven before. Well, well, listen, That's between you and God. But I know this, we haven't seen the veil of heaven. We've had a glimpse in Revelation chapter number 21 and 22. And just that glimpse is enough to about put your brain on overload. When I think about a gate of pearl, not a gate of pearls, each gate, 12 of them, of one pearl. That alone just kind of makes me think for a while. What about roads, streets of gold as clear as glass? Now, I know a lot about gold. I sold rings and jewelry for a few years while I was in Bible college. I've never seen gold so magnificent that it was transparent. So I gave you just a couple nuggets to think about right there uh, while you are waiting for the turkey to cook today. Uh, Imagine a whole eternity full of these things. We don't know it. We can't see it, but we believe it. The ledger of my sin. You know, every time I think I'm doing pretty well, you know, God reveals a few things to me and says, you know, you're not probably as much of a, you know, peach as you think you are. And I, I noticed uh, that, that that's what God does to me to keep me humble. 
Whenever I think, God, you know, you've got a pretty good thing going on here. He says, do I? Let me just uh, show you a few things. But I trust him to take care of a sin debt of a ledger that I've never seen. And an eternity that I can't see. Then why can't I trust him with today? Why can't I trust him with tomorrow? Why do I treat him as batteries not included? He's capable. Oh, man. I mean, I love him. I just don't think he's got the juice to do what he says he's going to do. And if we were honest today, there's a lot of people who say, that's where I live. That's where I am. So what do we do? Well, we're commanded in Proverbs. One of the more famous verses in all the word of God, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I've heard people complain. It seems like pastors uh, uh, quote that all the time. You know why we quote it all the time? Because no one's figured it out yet. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Maybe when we get it down, we'll stop quoting it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. You know what all means in the Hebrew right there? All. You go in the original languages, it's still all. In all thy ways, with all thy heart. And what? He shall direct thy paths. So we have this God who is all powerful. And you know what he does? If you are a believer, not only is he powerful, but he transfers that power to us through the power of his Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Turn your Bibles quickly to uh, Philippians chapter 4. I could quote it, but we're going to go there. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Why can I do all things? Well, because I serve a God who is the God of the impossible. Now, we have to be careful about that verse. There are people who take that verse and say, you know what? I can deadlift 400 pounds because I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know what? I can eat the whole turkey by myself today and the trimmings because I can do all things through Christ and strengthen me. Well, listen, when you need a whole roll of Rolaids later today because you thought that's what I meant by that, don't call me, all right? My phone's not going to work. If you want the context of that verse, look right above in verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And no matter what state I am, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There are people here who are in different states today. I'm not talking about us traveling to different states and the tip ladies living in Florida and other people living in Massachusetts. I'm not talking about physical states. No, whatever state of life we are, because we serve the God who can do the impossible, we can do all all things through Christ, who is God, we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So what happens is when we doubt that God can do what he can do, then we doubt that God can do what he can do through us. Do you see that? When we doubt that God can do what he can do, then further we have to doubt that God can do what he can do through us. So what do we do? We're anemic. What do we do? We name the name of Christ but we don't live like Christians. We name the name of Christ, but we have no fruit or very little fruit. What do we do? We name the name of Christ, but it's like we're not attached to the vine. Remember, he's the vine, we're the branches. Apart from him, we can do a few things. Apart from him, we can bear some fruit. No, I didn't change Bible versions while I was gone. Apart from him, we can do nothing why because he has the power and if we doubt that he has that type of power then we cannot do all things 
through Christ. See, God, who has that power, has trusted us with that power. Do you realize this morning that God has the power to bring victory over sin in your life, that sin that does so easily beset you? God has that power to be able to allow you to break the bonds of sin within your own life, the bonds of your own wicked flesh. Uh, God is the one who can reconcile a family when it seems like it's not possible. God is the one who can bring you through a trial. God is the one who can heal a body or God is the one who can heal a soul. God is the one that can do that which man says is impossible. God can do it. So stop treating him like someone who has no power and realize that the one with no power is actually you. We shouldn't be treating him as the one with no power, and we should realize that the one with no power is you and I. That's why we get our power through Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. But we doubt that God is the God of the impossible. Then what does that do to us? Then we lay around like Christian lumps just waiting for Jesus to come back. Because after all, what can he do in such a wicked day? What can he do with such a wicked government? What can he do with such a wicked society and such wicked entertainment and, and with, with, with such a wicked world system of which Satan is the master over? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we feel like God can't do anything, but he can. I'll leave you with this. There is no healthy relationship in life where we can constantly question someone's abilities and motives and have a good, healthy relationship. Think of that in a marriage. If one spouse is constantly doubting the other spouse's abilities and motives, that's not a good recipe for a good relationship. What about children and parents? The children doubting the motives, the abilities of the parents. You know, I never worried about my father and mother providing for me. It just was always there. Now, I know it was hard. I realize now as an adult, there were times of great difficulty for them. We were as blue collar as you could get. But I also understand this. I never worried when I was seven years old if dad was going to put food on the table. It was just always on the table. So when that trust is broken, that's not a good, healthy relationship. Or even parents to children. When the parents doubt the motives of the children or the abilities of the children and there are some listen there are some parents who will say well you i mentioned this a few weeks ago or a few months ago i don't remember when i was here uh, i mentioned when a parent will tell a child you'll never amount to anything well that's not a good healthy relationship starter is it even in the workplace listen if you're constantly doubting the abilities of your boss or the owner of your company you know what you're going to do after a while? You're going to find a new place to work because that's not a good, healthy, stable workplace. So we understand this about every relationship in life, that to have that type of relationship is toxic, but we treat God like that almost every day. We treat him like that almost every day. God, I don't trust that you can do it. I don't trust that you can heal. I don't trust that you can help. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean he's always going to do things your way. And we also understand that other people have free will and that God will not force the bended knee of someone else. But at the same time, can God make a well in the desert? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The answer is yes. And if we doubt that, not just theologically, but in our day-to-day -day life, then we've made a big mistake. I started with batteries not included. That, that's one thing that you have to do with a toy. But have you ever had a toy or maybe a piece of electronics that's so messed up that you only have one option? And you never want to use this unless it gets really bad. And it's called the factory reset. You ever had to do that on a phone? I'll help some of you. A VCR? Oh, wait, an eight-track player? Um, but uh, I said, you're, you're speaking my language, Pastor. Uh, so you know what you have to do? The factory reset. That means whatever changes you have made that have made the piece of electronics inoperable, it's going to take it back to what it should be so you can use it again. So maybe for you today, it shouldn't be batteries not included. It's just be, Lord, I need a factory reset. 
I need to get back to where you would have me to be in trusting that you are the God who accomplishes the impossible. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.